Hello. All right. Well, tonight I thought um, that I would do a booberry. I had so much fun doing that Frankenberry last week that I thought I'd keep it up. And then, um, depending on how much fun I have tonight, we might follow it up with a um, Count Chocula next week. But we'll see. It's funny. I looked up um, Booberry while I was how waiting for the... Uh, I was waiting for the stream to start and um like i'm did not ever realize this but he's got chains hooked to his nipples did not expect that he has a bowl on a chain box of cereal on a chain and they are both like pierced to his chest So, so that's a fun discovery. That's like discovering Frankenberry's um, ballet slippers last week. Sometimes you just don't notice this stuff. Hey, Rudak, good evening to you. And hey, Pippi Pop. Yeah, <laughs> Kink Perry. Yeah, that's a, that's a good name for him. So I did, even did um, a little sketch getting ready for this of where I'm going. Um, so yeah, so that's that. And I think I'm going to do the same thing as I did last week where it's going to be all acrylic ink. Can you see that okay? <laughs> BDSM Barry. Hey, Ed. It's good to see it. Yeah, it has been a while, Rudak. How you been? Oh my gosh, Rudak. I hope you get to take a break soon. Oh, you're done now, though. Good. I hope you're enjoying some time off then. Oh, hey, the, um, the big comic book news I got tonight is that, um, Lonesome Hunters, The Wolf Child, number one, comes out on Wednesday. So if you are going to be near a comic shop, you can grab one of them, or two or three. It's all good.
I think it turned out good. I'm really um, excited for people to read this next story arc. Um, like I was really proud of the first story arc, but um, I just learned a lot with the first one and applied it to the second one. I think it's good. Hey, Don. Thanks for stopping by. I almost missed your comment. What does Booberry's hands look like? They look like three-leafed clovers. Oh, and he's got eyebrows. Yeah, I'm glad you're living too. Man, I don't know exactly what to do with this hand. <clears throat> like, he's a ghost, so he should look like he needs to be tortured. Like, like, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, Edie, the guys who are the people who designed this, um, I think it is really hard to tell um, if they were into it or they were, like, taking the piss out of it because it's, um, it's just so weird. That's sort of how I feel when I watch um, like old He-Man cartoons where you just can't tell if the people writing it are just really weird and really into it or if they're not into it at all and just doing weird shit because they, they don't care. Yeah, has it always been like that, Don, where the cereals are only available around Halloween? I kind of kind of felt like that they were everywhere when I was like they were always around when I was a kid, but um but I don't remember. I think I mentioned this last last week too, but I think Toy Galaxy did a episode about these guys. And they probably go over all that.
<laughs> you have to cross the border to get Count Chocolate and Pretty Pebbles. Yeah, you know, that's like, um, you probably could have come across with some Kinder Surprises or whatever and made the exchange at the border. <laughs> the hardware and hat store. The vibe I get with Booberry is that he's like a, a beatnik or something. Like that, his hat and his little bow tie reminds me of like, I don't know, like people I've seen in Archie comics that like would drive fast cars or something. Like teenagers, but with like almost beat Nicky, kind of beachy. I don't know. I don't know what his fucking deal is. But he actually, he could look like he worked at a hardware store or like a, um, even be like a soda jerk down at the malt shop or something. Yeah, exactly. Pork pie hats. That is, is that what this is? Is a pork pie? Might be. Oh, and before I forget, the other thing I got going on is if you're in Portland tomorrow, I'm going to be at uh, Books with Pictures Con, which is at the uh, Portland Books with Pictures. And I'm just going to be there for the brunch. So I think it, it starts at 10 a.m. and goes for a couple hours. And I'm pretty sure it's free to attend. So if you're in Portland and you want to come say hi, please do. That'd be great. I don't know if I got that good at John Hatt's Pippi, I think um, I think I'm getting better on it with um, Lonesome Hunters, but it's still, man, hats are a challenge. Like that one of the things with hats, especially there's stuff like baseball caps, I find really hard to draw because they're like, there are so many like slightly different um, ways that people wear their hats that are sort of like culturally significant.
So it's never just about like drawing the hat. It's about like exactly how would this character wear their baseball cap. And fedoras are kind of the same way. Like there are so many different like variations of fedoras. I think I talked on here before I went and actually bought a fedora to draw Howard in the Lonesome Hunters. And um, picking out a hat was so hard because I was shopping for a hat that would not necessarily look good on me, but would look good on um, an old man. So I ended up getting one, like, I don't know, it was just funny to be putting one on my head in the hat store. And the sales guy was trying to help, but he was like, that looks good on you. And I'm like, no, doesn't matter how it looks on me. <laughs> he was a little tripped out at first, but I eventually like explained to him what I was doing, that it was for reference for a comic book. And he was sort of like, whoa, he seemed to be kind of fascinated by that. Pork pie hats, Rudak were, um, Oppenheimer was sort of famous for wearing a pork pie hat. And I think they were kind of like, I don't know. I'd have to look it up to know for sure. I always, when I think of a pork pie, I always think of sort of like, um, you know, those straw hats they used to wear at, in like the twenties with like the, crown was really flat and the brim was really flat and I think of pork pies like that only in leather or like felt not leather but I could be wrong He's haunted. Booberry is creepy because he has unfinished berry business on earth. <laughs> well, thanks, Redak. Yeah, Edie, I think a, uh, any sort of leather hat would last forever, but it would probably not be pleasant. It seems like it'd be really friggin' hot. Oh my gosh, you know who this guy might be? Um, 
I do not know the name of this the singer. Like who sang that song? I found my thrill on Blueberry Hill. I bet that's what this guy's a reference to. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Bill. <laughs> no, no, no boobs tonight. I'm the only boob on stream tonight. Is that Fats Domino? I don't know anything about Fats Domino. I always thought he was more of a, a blues guitar guy. Hey, Kelly. Oh, Don, that's a good point. Like, yeah. That point being that um, Booberry was probably based off of a blues musician, which, like, <laughs> Fat Stoner was big on the piano, literally. Yeah, I bet that's who this guy's based off of. I'm going to say that that is 100% accurate and not look it up to know for sure. Yeah, it, it, it's better that way. If this was, if this was on any other platform than YouTube, I would need to be accurate. Yeah, Kelly, I think he looked sleepy because he could not rest. He was, his soul was tortured.
<laughs> yeah, I don't know why, Edie, but he does have a cough syrup vibe. Hey, Kristen. Peter Lorre. Yeah, I could see that. I decided to skip the nipple piercings on my guy because he's tortured, just not like in a Hellraiser way. <laughs> Think these guys are taking the piss. They're pretty great characters, though, all of these serial characters. It might be airbrush time. I got to clean my airbrush a little bit. For years, I did not use an airbrush because I was scared of having to clean them all the time. But it turns out they're a lot more forgiving than you might think. Like usually the only real thing I do to them is I'll take out. So there's a needle that feeds down the middle of the airbrush. Goes right through here. And it comes all the way out the little tip. And the biggest thing I have to do is just clean off that needle. So when it gets, um, clogged it's usually just um, ink or paint or whatever sort of built up on that needle so you just take it out and this is a um, just a little piece of a, a magic eraser and I use that and clean it off and then nine times out of ten it's ready to go again although on 
I try every like every other month to sort of take it all the way apart and I have like a sonic cleaner that I soak it in for like 20 minutes. There was some sort of a f mummy. We talked about it last week. I can't remember what his name is. The reservoir has a lid. ED. I don't use it very often. It's just a... In fact, I don't even know where the lid is. It's just a... Um... Uh, like a little pressure fit thing. <laughs> Fruity Kruger. <laughs> That's a good, that would be a good one. Kristen, you know what? I used uh, airbrush frisket for the first time this week. And um, I'm very excited about it. <laughs> it's funny, like, it's something I should have been using. And so when I, years ago, when I first took some airbrush classes, you know, we used frisket in the class, but it just never, like, It never seemed like the way to go, but um, I had some very specific problems I had to solve this week, and Frisket ended up being the only way to do it. And luckily, I had some on hand that's been sitting in my drawer for, you know, probably nine, eight or nine years. But I don't use airbrush as like um, to do very detailed stuff. I kind of just use it as like, um, like this, where I'm doing sort of like a wash with it, you know? And the reason I needed it this week was because I was doing a, um, I had some panels in a comic I was drawing that were circular. 
and I needed to airbrush everything around them except for them. So, so Frisky worked out perfect for that. Yeah, it kept pretty well. You know, I had one place where I was putting it, putting the frisket over some uh, black ink, and it pulled up the ink just a tiny bit in a little spot. And it wasn't anything I couldn't fix with just going over it again. But um, but yeah, it makes me um, maybe want to experiment a little bit. In fact, I ordered. Um, some fresh frisket just this morning so that um, so that when I go to try it, use it again, it'll be fresh and hopefully I won't have that problem. No, Bill, check. It's this stuff. This is what I used was um, this. And it's like I don't have, well, here, I'll cut off a little piece. It's basically just a sticker. So this stuff is like, it's got paper backing and it's a clear thing and you can stick it down. And you can see through it perfectly well. But then you can also like, if you go very lightly, you can cut through the plastic without cutting through your paper. And you can peel up everything except for, I don't know how well that's showing up on camera. But it's great. I was, um, I think I was always scared to use it just because I've had zero luck with um, the paint on frisket. That stuff has ruined more um, paintings for me than like anything else. Oh, Kristen, you know, I've seen that same guy doing the, it looked like he's doing um, uh, acrylic paint or maybe gouache doing those animals. I, it feels like it's acrylic because he does like so many layers on those, but they're very like geometric and stuff. They're, if it's the same person I'm thinking of, they're very good. Yeah, Bill, the liquid frisket, I have a problem with because it like, um, well, I never am able to get it up, like get it off the paper without it like tearing the paper a little bit. But it's also like got so much surface tension that it's sometimes hard to like um, get it really fine. Like I think with this with the sticker frisket, you could actually do a lot more fine detail, especially if I had like a swivel blade. Those things are very handy for doing detailed cuts.
And then I'm going in with some Payne's Gray. This is all um, FW ink, by the way. This is all the acrylic ink. Which I've been slowly sort of moving to over watercolor for a lot of illustration stuff. Like for comics, like for my interior, like sequential pages, I've been tending to go with like a sort of a hybrid where I start off with watercolor and block in a lot of stuff. And then um, at a certain point, I switch to ink. And I haven't figured out a good, like quantifiable way to decide when I'm going to switch to ink. But, um, But that's how I've been working. And it's been working out great for me. Hey, Bill, have you seen those? Well, of course you have. You've seen those, the new um, six gun editions. They're kickstarting. Those look beautiful. Yeah, I liked those library editions that they did before, but um, but it was kind of weird how just how they all had different sort of designs going. Oh, some new material. That's exciting. Yeah, Pippi, Six Gun is like, I don't know. I'm a huge fan of just about everything that Cullen and um, Brian do. But Six Gun in particular is like really, you know, magical. That's like the, the book those two guys were sort of meant to do together, it feels like. I have not seen Midnight Show, Bill. What is that? Holy shit. No, I did not hear about this four issue series with the three of you guys. Is it out? Oh my gosh, that sounds really interesting. A hammer horror themed thing. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> Auto correct. Switching Halloween to Hallelujah is pretty great. Yeah, I have not seen or heard of that. That's um, that's really exciting, though. So everyone who doesn't know the um, uh, Colin Bunn is the writer of Harrow County, um, the book that I'm probably best well known for, and um, he's doing it with uh, Brian Hurt and Bill Crabtree, and. Uh, yeah, so it came out a long time ago, and I did a couple fill-in issues for it years ago. Um, but now they're doing some reprints in a beautiful library edition, and I think they're still kickstarting it right now. So if anybody wants to check it out, you can go on Kickstarter and just search for uh, Sixth Gun, and it'll come up. <laughs> yeah, ED, we got a celebrity in the house. As far as I know, Dark Horse has never done a Kickstarter. What do you guys think about publishers doing Kickstarters? Yeah, my feeling about publishers doing Kickstarters is that it kind of sucks, but it's like, but it's fine. <laughs> like, it sucks because a publisher should be able to, like, sell a book. Like, that's their job. Um, but, like, there is definitely something some things that Kickstarters can achieve that um, just nothing, nothing else can achieve. So it's just like, there's a certain amount of like, um, you know, just buzz or whatever that a Kickstarter can create that you just can't create any other way.
So it doesn't it like it doesn't bum me out that publishers do it, but it bums me out that like any publisher has to do it kind of. Yeah, Don, I don't know if Kickstarters always do put more money in the creator's pockets, but it definitely, like, um, like, it's just, it's definitely nice to be able to, like, um, break even before the book even comes out, like, and not have to wonder if the book is going to break even or not, you know? Yeah, Joseph, it does like, like, it just, it feels weird, but at the same time, like, um, that Keanu Reeves Berserker book that they kickstarted a couple years ago, like, that's one of those books where it's like, man, Keanu Reeves would have sold, just having his name on that book would have sold a, a million issues, but putting it on Kickstarter, they were probably able to sell two million issues, you know? Yeah, Joseph, but if like uh if the creators were able to kickstart it, there's like no reason to take it to a publisher. You know, if they've already like been able to make their money off of it, why would they give half of it to a publisher? Yeah, Bill, the idea behind Berserker Kickstarter was to reach audience that doesn't frequent comic book stores, which is like, like that's just one of the giant roadblocks in the industry. Is just having comics only being in comic shops. Back in the days when they were in grocery stores, you know, people sold hundreds of thousands of copies of stuff constantly. And now if a book sells a hundred thousand copies, it's a, like a big deal. Yeah, Don, that is a interesting point. Like that it does take away from local comic stores, but like a lot of times that stuff still is made available for comic shops. So like the comic shops will get like the sales of people who missed the Kickstarter, but still like, yeah, it's impossible to say if, they're actually missing out on sales or if they're just like um, picking up extra sales that like Kickstarter missed, you know?
it's definitely not like a cut and dry thing though. Like, I don't think you can say it's like 100% good or 100% bad. Yeah, Joseph, I like, I, I usually feel less weird about um, Kickstarters if they include a, a retailer tier so that they can actually like buy at a retail price. And I think every publisher who's done a Kickstarter has also released it through like sort of the regular distributor means to so if like a comic shop wanted to get it later, they could get it in a normal, normal way. Oh, Bill, I did not realize that about the Kickstarter, the Berserker Kickstarter, that it was only for the hardcover edition. You know, Pippi, I have not heard of that, that people are crowdfunding variant covers. I wouldn't be surprised if that were true. Oh my gosh, Don, that sounds amazing to do a, to be able to get free copies to into a library. Actually, like just about every Kickstarter I have ever contributed to, if there was a option to get the book put in the library too, I would probably pay for that.
I don't know if this was the best idea. I was thinking that this ghost was transparent and you could see the hat through through his transparent ghost flesh, but uh, no, that's working okay. All right, I think the next thing Hmm, I think the next thing is to do a background. Oh, hey, Mark. Oh, wow. Can you say what podcast you were doing? Oh, yeah. I've listened to that a couple times. That's a very fun. Wait, is that? Have I listened to that before? There was one I listened to a while back that you were on. Had to have been the Hellboy one. Maybe not, though. I don't know. Fuck, man. I don't know. It was a while ago. <laughs> Anyway, I'm glad you're here, and I hope your podcast went well. Oh, yeah, Mark, that's probably the one I listened to was the um, book club, probably because you were talking about Har Harrow County. I'm usually not a big like reader of reviews or stuff of my work. But um, in my experience, when somebody talks about one of my books on a podcast, they're usually very nice about it. Like there's not a lot of podcasters who want to spend time talking about a book they didn't like. So those can sometimes be fun. It's always nice to hear people talk nice about your work. <laughs> Yeah, if you want, um, if you guys want to talk to me and uh, Colin about Harrow County, I'm sure we could figure that out too.
I just recorded a podcast with the um, comic book couples counseling guys that I think is going to go up soon. I don't know, though. I don't know what's going on. Up. But they're always fun to talk to. Yeah, Brad and Lisa. For folks who have never listened to that podcast, they do a podcast from the point of view of um, different characters, usually romantic, but not always romantic relationships. Uh, but they also do a lot of like creator interviews that are really good. But I like them. They take a they have a very um, sort of thoughtful approach to reading comics that is um, very fun. Yeah, that would be really fun. Talk to talk about Tales of Air County. I think those stories turned out pretty great. I wish that more people had been into them.
Kelly. I bet he's he's more of a Boo Earns bearing. <laughs> yeah, just remember, Pippi, every time you eat cereal, you're eating the soul of, who do we decide, Peter, Peter Lorre? Yeah, if General Mills had any courage, they would definitely do a human centipede cereal. But we all know that General Mills is full of cowards. <laughs> oh my god kelly yeah i bet general mills is stolen valor yeah mark this is the uh this is the look you get when you need this much sugar First thing in the morning. Gonna get a little bit of acrylic gouache going. I was using the FW white ink, but it's not quite opaque enough for, for what I need here.
Kristen, no, I have not tried Holbein Acrylic Ink. I didn't know that they made that. I would be very interested in trying that. I'm going to be near an art store tomorrow for the first time in months. So I might um, pop in and see if they have some of that. Yeah, have you used it, Kristen? Nice. Yeah, I will definitely try that. Like, I usually use the FW white, and it's pretty good. It's pretty opaque, but it's not like I have never found a a white that is, you know, really opaque, opaque outside of say like oil paints or something. Um, gouache is the next best thing, but. Um, I don't know, both gouache and acrylic gouache have their like drawbacks. Like one of the things about it is it's hard to go over it again with the gouache and, and acrylic gouache. Acrylic gouache is easier than normal gouache because it, it dries waterproof, but it's still a little bit textury sometimes. But Daniel Warren Johnson, man, that dude uses white out so aggressively. If he likes it, I bet like he's one of those dudes who knows he knows his white outs.
Oh man, nice Rudak. I I love that dude's stream. I wish I could um, catch it more often, but he's sort of like right in the middle of my work day. But well, at least I catch him like over the weekend. Usually, I'll watch. I'll watch him and get caught up. All right, I think this is the, the final stretch. Just a little bit of black ink. You think he's more gruesome than Frankenberry? I don't know. This guy's gruesome in a different kind of way, I guess.
<laughs> oh my gosh, Chris, that didn't even occur to me. Yeah, that necktie is on there in a definitely in a gross way. <laughs> oh my gosh this blueberry being a mascot for kids going through the trauma of divorce is great <laughs> I heard you laughing, Maude. I wasn't sure if that's what you were laughing about. It's all the way on the other end of the house. Oh my gosh. 
We're going a little long tonight. All right, I think I am ready to call it quits on this guy. Maybe not. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Try on find. I'm sure that's the case, Kelly, about Burberry. All right. You guys ready for tape? Let me see. That's like closer to what I'm seeing, I think. Bye, Pippi. Take care. I hope to see you next week. to get it in frame. There we go. All right. Well, just to um, remind you, if you're in Portland, I'm going to be at the Books with Pictures Con tomorrow morning, starting at 10 a.m. Um, if anybody's around, it'd be fun to say hi. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. I hope everyone has a great weekend. And don't forget to tell the people you love how much you love them. And I love all you guys. Take care.